Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Robinhood's path to IPO. The popular trading app is said to have filed confidentially, setting its sights on a NASDAQ listing. Despite regulatory scrutiny and lawsuits, you can expect a head-turning valuation. We'll break it all down in a Bloomberg scoop. Plus, aggressive and destructive cyber attacks against companies and governments on the rise. Why haven't U.S. cyber forces stopped them? What's really at stake? We'll speak to the head of IronNet Cybersecurity and former director of the NSA, General Keith Alexander. And Amazon anoints a new head of its cloud unit company veteran, Adam Solipsky, to take the reign. We'll tell you all about him. All those stories in a moment, but first to the markets and some big breaking news about Intel. Our Ed Ludlow and Kriti Gupta standing by. Ed, I'll start with you. New Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger embarking on an ambitious plan for reinvention. What can you tell us? Yeah, Redhead's crossing the Bloomberg terminal. Intel is going to spend $20 billion on two new factories in Chandler, Arizona, adjacent to its existing facility there. It's also going to launch a new arm, a foundry business that will build semiconductors for other companies. That puts it, of course, in direct competition with TSMC, which is widely regarded as the world's best third-party manufacturer of semiconductors. It's really interesting. It's an opposite strategy to what Wall Street was looking at. They thought that Intel might outsource more chip production and scale back its historic business of building chips in-house. Not to be the complete opposite. It's doubling down, investing heavily. And what's interesting is Gelsinger is talking about actually expanding that manufacturing internationally down the road. We could see more U.S. factories, more factories in Europe. Let's get to some of the after-hours action and movers because the stock is moving on this headline. Intel currently up around 1.3% in after hours trading on Tuesday. Interesting as well to look at TSMC and some movement in that stock. It will have profound uh, impact on the supply chain because very few of the names we know in the semiconductor space, the likes of Qualcomm, AMD, for example, make their own chips. They outsource to a third party. You can see that after hours action there. That's the Taiwan Semiconductor ADRs, American Depository Receipts. You can see the stock down 1.7% in after hours. So Clearly, the market's paying attention to this. Intel in this move, Ed, shirking pressure to outsource its chips and then instead doubling down with his $20 billion on two new chip plants in Arizona. Uh, Gelsinger saying they've got more planned in the U.S. and in Europe. What does this mean for the chip shortage that we've been talking about so much and has really plagued the supply chain? Yeah, it's really that reliance that I was talking about. A lot of the names that we come across in the chip sector rely on Taiwan's TSMC and Samsung to actually manufacture the chips for them. So when President Biden and the White House made that executive order to fix the supply chain, a lot of the focus was on bringing domestic production back to the United States, increasing production capacity. If you read across Wall Street, the issue for the global economy, the concern was that it takes a lot of time and a lot of dollars of investment to make that happen, to build new factories, to increase installed capacity. Well, if you look at Intel's plan, that's exactly what they're doing. $20 billion to start, but as I said, Gelsinger hinting that this could be a global expansion with more factories coming down the line in Europe as well as the United States. That direct co competition with TSMC. TSMC is already building chips, manufacturing chips for some of Intel's clients. So there's that sort of competitive angle uh, that puts them on a direct collision course. I think analysts are going to be paying really close attention to this over the coming days. Kriti Gupta, though. So, What's going uh, on in the broader markets? Right. Kriti Break yeah, it down. Absolutely. Well, you saw a lot of pain across the markets generally, but tech was no exception. What was actually the key outperformer here is going to be those big tech names. You can see on the chart right behind me, from top to bottom, from the NASDAQ 100 all the way to the S&P 500, even the semiconductors really taking a step back. It was those big tech names that fared well today. Once again, Haven seemed to outperform. But I do want to show you the NASDAQ QQQ. If you hop into my terminal and look at the ETF that tracks the NASDAQ 100, you can actually see that it has most recently got its biggest inflow 
all the way back to the dot-com bubble. Now, some of that has to do with simply the opportunity around quadruple witching that we saw last Friday, this major idea that those liquidity windows, the ability to get a little bit of better margins in terms of buying in, really incentivize a lot of investors to hop right back into tech. And of course, this is crucial after we've seen quite a bit of tech pain coming off of those yield serves, that sensitivity, extremely important. But I think after hours right now, the biggest story is going to be, right after Intel, is going to be GameStop. And that's really the aftermarket action I want to look. Of course, you're seeing those shares decline. You did see an initial jump when you started to hear uh, comments about them missing estimates, but still actually bringing up a new emphasis on things like e-commerce, uh, recruiting a Amazon and Google veteran, Jenna Owens, to lead their operations. Crucial, though, to remember, in the last seven out of eight uh, earnings quarters, you did see GameStop actually uh, decline after those results. So it looks like they're just following the pattern here, Emily. All right, Krita Gupta at Ludlow, thank you so much for that roundup. Just want to note we're going to be speaking with Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger Wednesday. You do not want to miss this conversation as he lays out an ambitious plan to double down on in-house manufacturing of chips after Intel has lagged some of its biggest competitors like TSMC. We're going to talk more about that throughout the hour and speak with Pat directly tomorrow. All right, coming up, we'll dive deeper into Intel's plans for reinvention, what it means for the broader chip sector with Ivan Feinseth of Tigris. That reaction next. This is Bloomberg. Back to that breaking news on Intel. New CEO Pat Gelsinger unveiling plans for a manufacturing revival with billions of dollars to be spent on new factories and a new foundry business that will make chips for other companies, putting Intel in direct competition with arguably the world's best chip maker, and that is Taiwan Semi. For more insight, I want to bring in Ivan Feinseth, Director of Research and Chief Investment Officer at Tigris Financial Partners. Ivan, for a company that has struggled to produce, is this the right move? Absolutely the right move. Intel was the original chip innovator and manufacturer, and they are going back in that direction. I think it's the perfect time and the right thing to do. But can they pull this off? That's the big question. They missed the deadline for the 10 nanometer and the 7 nanometer. Yes, they have new leadership, but, you know, what's going to be different? Well, I think, uh, I don't know if they missed... The deadline, but there's always the need for new chips, new innovation. And, and I think the key thing that we will see here, especially under its new CEO, Pat Gelsinger, because he worked at VMware, which pioneered software driven server power. And they've talked about for a long time that Moore's Law reaching a, a diminishing return as far as what hardware can do. And just as you've seen software-defined networks, I think you will see software-defined processing power in chips. And I think that will be talk a little bit about the future. Talk a little bit about the politics of this, because uh, the U.S. is getting chip manufacturing on U.S. soil, which is something the Biden administration certainly wants. And to be fair, President Trump was asking for for years. Well, uh, I think it's the right way to go. I mean, first of all, we, we have to not be so dependent on uh, a China-based supply chain, but a global supply chain. And also the fact that uh, the, the lowest cost of production actually exists in the U.S. We have high-quality talent. We have a very supportive production infrastructure, which I think we will see very shortly from the Biden administration, a new infrastructure investment bill, which will only help that. So uh, you, you got to produce locally and you got to keep innovating. And I think that we will see this reemergence of innovation and production from Intel. Talk about where this places Intel with respect to its rivals, whether it's Taiwan Semiconductor or AMD, or even Apple or Amazon, which are now focusing on making their own chips in-house? Well, they've fallen behind in a couple of areas, but they've always really focused on the high-powered, high-margin server processors, which drives the whole migration to the cloud and also this new concept of edge computing. So you're going to see the key trends, which are wireless. By the way, also um, 
AI, which is powered by high-speed and high-powered processors, and autonomous automobile technology, of which Intel owns Mobileye, which also relies on, will rely on edge computing and these, uh, the 5G network and these other supporting factors, and increasing processing power for both servers and going back to um, you know, portable devices or, or laptops and, and desktops. So I think that they are uh, going to reposition themselves to be ahead of every major technology processor trend. Intel now saying they see the foundry market hitting a billion dollars, excuse me, a hundred billion dollars by 2025. Talk to us a little bit about what Pat Gelsinger brings in terms of new leadership. There have been a series of new leaders at Intel going back to Brian Krasanich and then of course Bob Swan. What do you think Pat Gelsinger can and, and will do differently? Two things. He's an engineer and they're going to focus on their engineering roots. And the second, as I started to talk about, being able to bring the concept of software-defined processing power, that a lot more will be reliant on the software or firmware that's embedded in the chips to create capability and processing power in addition to just the silicon or, uh, or, or the actual hardware processing power. I was going to say also gallium arsenide, which is going to be the next big thing for you know, – it is the, the growing processor driver. All right, uh, Ivan, lots to cover. We're going to continue to talk about this throughout the hour. Ivan Feinseth of Tigris, thanks so much. We're also going to hear from Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger Wednesday, part of my conversation with him starting 1 p.m. Eastern right here on Bloomberg Television. You don't want to miss it. And coming up on the heels of some of the most destructive cyber attacks in world history, and as the pandemic fuels a global push to digital transformation, cybersecurity companies are on a tear. We're going to speak with IronNet CEO General Keith Alexander about his company going public via SPAC and the threats ahead. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Cyber attackers are getting increasingly aggressive and increasingly destructive. Cyber attacks hitting 44% of targets in the IT sector in all of last year, and their targets expanding to national security, health, telecom. Joining me now to discuss the new fronts opening in cyberspace, retired General Keith Alexander, IronNet founder, co-CEO and chair, and also, of course, the former director of the National Security Agency under President Obama. I want to start, though, with some market developments and IronNet, General Alexander, going public via SPAC. Why choose that route? Why for a cybersecurity company and why now? Well, that's a great, great question. The reason it's early for us to go public, but we have a unique capability to detect events in cyberspace that others can't see with behavioral analytics. And more importantly, we can share that at network speed across companies to create true collective defense at speed. We think that's needed and it's worth the time now to go public early and get that out there. We think we can own that space and we think that's the future of cybersecurity. It works with other companies. You know, we're not replacing all cybersecurity, but we are creating a way to help companies, sectors, states, and nations defend in ways we've never been able to in the past. That's what we're bringing to the table. And that's why we're doing a SPAC now. Well, and nations are certainly getting increasingly aggressive, whether it is Russia or China. We've been following the Microsoft Exchange hack, uh, allegedly or originating uh, within China. What do they appear to be after, in your view, and, and what is the end game in this particular case? So that's different than, of course, the solar winds. China is looking for intellectual property. How do they get into companies? How do they get intellectual property or information on people to help them get intellectual property or to compete in business? They're looking at that to give them an economic edge in this space. And they've been doing that for years. You know, the last time we talked, we talked about that being the greatest transfer of wealth in history, their theft of our intellectual property. We've got to do a better job of defending. And the real problem is every company tries to defend today. If you think about that, think about 90 banks out there with 10 people. 
They're all trying to defend their part. Now imagine if we allowed those to network together, 900 people defending together, how much better we'd be secured if we could work together in cyberspace. We could defend the private sector and the private sector could let the government know the attacks that are ongoing. I think that's what changes. That's what we have to do to push back on China. They're going to keep stealing as long as they get away with it. And you can see on the Microsoft thing, they went a lot, they pushed a lot in over a short period of time to steal a lot of information. They were brazen about it. They didn't care that we saw. That should set great concern to all of us. This is a huge problem. We've got to solve it. Then of course, there's the solar winds hack, which originated allegedly in Russia. We're continuing to get reaction to that from the White House and beyond. Take a listen uh, to some of the things that are being said. This isn't the only case of malicious cyber activity of likely Russian origin, either for us or for our allies and partners. The United States government uh, is constantly under threat from cyber attacks, not only U.S. government systems, but U.S. commercial uh, private sector systems as well. This is an ongoing challenge. We need international society, international rules of the road on cybersecurity. We have to bring along our allies and our friends so we hold everyone accountable. This is a very serious situation. Uh, it's a very widespread hacking. It is very serious. We don't know the depth of it yet. We have to spend a lot of time and analyze it. But we are vulnerable in ways we never imagined. In your view, General Alexander, who's to blame for the solar winds hack? Why didn't the NSA or U.S. Cyber Command stop it? Uh, really straightforward. They don't have the authority to see attacks nor the ability to see attacks on our country. We haven't done that. That was one of the things that Congress asked me, what do we need to fix? We told them that. And I can remember several senators saying, well, if we don't fix that, then shame on us. So step one, we have to build the ability for the private sector and the public sector to work together. NSA, we don't want NSA nor Cyber Command in their networks. We want them to be able to call and say, I'm having a problem. And right now they can't see the problem with the tools they have. So we're in this dilemma. Everybody can point fingers. And the reality is you need the ability to see threats. You need the ability to share that in an anonymized way across companies and between the public and private sector. We've got to solve that problem. It's not about blame. We're being attacked. And what we're doing is we're saying missiles are hitting us, who should we blame? And the answer is all of us right now, we can blame because we know we need a better defense. Let's get out and create that better defense. The way we've been doing it doesn't work. We need to take this next step and come up with a true behavioral set of capabilities that can share anomalies at network speed and help us to defend our nation and work with our right. allies. So when you look at the increasingly aggressive attacks of nation states, of Russia, of China, would you say that we're on the verge of an all out cyber war or are we already in one? I think I'd take a step back. I think from Russia, my view, Russia was trying to figure out what we were doing on indicting the GRU folks that did the attack on Ukraine in 2017 and they were collecting a lot of information. But your point, I would now say, look at what they learned. They got into 18,000 companies. That's a huge problem. This is something that our country needs to step back and say, if that had been destructive against those 18,000 companies, we're in a totally different place. We need to step up. We need to figure out how we're going to solve this problem. And it can't be, please don't attack us, because when something bad happens, they will. So we now need to say, OK, how are we going to work with us, within our country, and with our allies to defend in this space. All our wealth, our future is right. in this network. So we got to solve this. Now, uh, General, you were recently appointed to the board of Amazon. Big leadership changes happening there. Of course, Jeff Bezos stepping down later this year. Andy Jassy, who's been running AWS, becoming CEO. Amazon uh, tapping Adam Solipsky to run the cloud division, which is a hugely important division and certainly on the front lines of these threats in cyberspace. 
How, as giant as Amazon is, how vulnerable do you think they are uh, to a large scale attack? And, um, you know, certainly I imagine you're going to bring that kind of expertise to the board. Well, I'll tell you what an honor and privilege it is to be on the board. They have great people. They do a great job. I love the way the board works, the way they ask questions. Everybody's well, really well prepared for this. It's a, it's an honor to be on there. And they go through these processes and they want to do it right. I'm just really impressed with that. Beyond that, I can't talk about it. They are secure. I like the way they do the security. So I think they're great in this area. But if you look at what's happened to Microsoft as well, I guess, would you say, is anybody uh, safe? Is any company safe? Can any well, think, company do yeah. enough? Well, I think this is where you now get into a collective defense. What are the roles and responsibilities between all the companies that are out there, between the intermediate layer, think of this as your IT, and now the cloud providers, each with different attributes and capabilities. So an Amazon cloud is fundamentally different than a Microsoft cloud. And I think in those differences brings pluses and minuses. And in the case of Microsoft, it has issues with Office 365 and Active Directory, that line of attacks. But I think your, your greater point here is, think about how do we work together as a nation and as nations in the space? And the answer is this is an area where we perhaps don't compete we actually need to work together for the common defense. How do we do that? Because that's that's the right thing to do. You know, you think about your family, you think about your business, you think about your city, your state, all of these now are wired to this internet. How do we defend them? And it can't be every company's competing in defense. In this area, we've got to work together. We've got to figure out how to bring those together, the best together and solve this problem. I think that's part of the future. Right. All right. General Keith Alexander, so great to have you on the show. We'll be following the SPAC as uh, that develops. Uh, Co-CEO of IronNet there, uh, retired General Keith Alexander. Thank you. Now to a few other stories we're continuing to watch. Of course, Prince Harry has a new title. The Duke of Sussex landing a job as a tech executive, becoming the chief impact officer of a Silicon Valley startup called BetterUp. It's a coaching and mental health company. Harry and his wife, Meghan Markle, gave up their roles as full-time working members of the British royal family. And as that controversy continues to consume the tabloid, the couple are building a new life in California with new lucrative deals, including with Netflix and Spotify. All right, coming up, Robinhood said to have filed confidentially for an IPO. All the details in a Bloomberg scoop next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Let's get back to that Intel news, the company doubling down on making chips in-house and in the United States in a new $20 billion commitment. Our Ed Ludlow has been continuing to dig through the headlines. Ed, what more can you tell us? Yeah, it's not what analysts were expecting, right? Not just that they're going to expand their own production capacity, but they will make chips for other companies. The lines continue to come out. Actually, they're saying that full year revenue will come in at around $72 billion. That's less than the market was expecting. But we did expect a year on year decrease between tw last year and this year. And, and in terms of how they're going to fix that longer term, they're really putting their money where their mouth is, not just the 20 billion on two new, new, new factories longer term, but they expect full year capex to come in between 19 billion and 20 billion dollars in a single year you know that's really putting your money where your mouth is you know the story around intel is one that they have fallen behind in recent years a lot of ha is happening after hours in terms of the reaction to this in the markets so let's flip up the boards and take a look at what's going on intel soaring up 4.8 percent in after hours but you see this Rentac ETF, which closely follows many of the semiconductor uh, companies, up four tenths of one percent. A mixed bag within that basket, of course, because many companies will kind of be benefiting from this Intel move. Some will be facing increased competition, including TSMC, which had its own hopes for building a factory in Arizona. One other that I want to point out in After Hours: Applied Materials up four point four percent. 
Why? Because applied materials makes the machines that make the chips. If you're building new factories, it makes complete sense that the company that's going to be decking them out is also popping in after hours, Emily. Now, Ed, this is kind of the opposite of what many on Wall Street expected Intel to do. Yeah. Why the U-turn? Yeah, you know, Pat Gelsinger, when he was announced as the new CEO, he's a former longtime Intel executive who had gone away to VMware and come back. He's a technologist, and it seems like he's doubling down on Intel's legacy. Look at the shares of Intel, this orange line, relative to the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index and relative to T TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor, now a direct rival because of this announcement around a foundry business. This is a five-year chart that tells the story. Intel has clearly lagged behind the broader market but also its new rival, TSMC. And specifically, it's been in manufacturing. It's fallen behind in the cutting-edge manufacturing processes that make the chips so efficient, make them so cost-effective. But they're doing something about it, and that's why we see this pop in after hours. Up 5.3% now. Taiwan Semiconductor, this is the US ADR, down 4.4%. Of course, it's going to take time. We know that the Biden administration wanted some domestic production capacity for chips sorted out long-term. But this is a first step, and it looks like Wall Street is welcoming it with open arms. Emily. Right. Interesting also to hear Gelsinger talk about those production issues. He said they figured out the problem, and it won't happen again. Uh, of course, we shall see. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow, thanks so much for that update. Reminder, I'll be talking to Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger Wednesday. You can catch that conversation starting 1 p.m. Eastern time right here on Bloomberg Television. Meantime, the popular trading app Robinhood is said to have filed confidentially for a U.S. IPO in a Bloomberg scoop. We first reported this might happen weeks ago. I also recently sat down with Robinhood CEO and co-founder Vlad Tenev and asked him about the path to going public. Without committing at that time, he voiced confidence in the company from the point of view of investors. Clearly, this is a business that requires capital and I think we, we've shown that we have a variety of means to, to capitalize the business, um, and we see a huge growth opportunity ahead of us. Our own Katie Roof is all over this story, as well as a Microsoft potential play for the chat platform Discord, popular among gamers and retail traders. Katie, I want to start with Robinhood, though. Um, what can you tell us uh, in terms of the timing of Robinhood's road to IPO. Sure, yeah, good to be with you. So we just broke the news a little bit ago that Robinhood has now filed for its much anticipated or you know, much talked about potential IPO. Uh, and the company just confirmed that moments ago, um, confirmed our report. Uh, so, so, yeah, they've submitted a confidential filing with the SEC. So we're not going to see their financial numbers just yet. But they are still sticking with their plan. Despite all the, the GameStop controversies, they um, are still moving forward with their original timeline. Um, of course, they haven't, you know, you know, their filing hasn't come out just yet. And their debut is still probably at least a couple months away. So things could still change. But at the moment, they're still, you know, moving moving right along with the plans. Uh, our understanding is that the earliest they could debut would be late, the late second quarter. Uh, so, um, you know, maybe late spring, early summer would be the earliest we could see something. But, of course, um, you know, it could get pushed back to later this year. Or, uh, um, but Katie, they do want to go this year. As we've been speaking... Robinhood uh, releasing information, uh, a statement uh, since you broke your story uh, that they have confidentially filed to go public, that uh, the IPO will happen after the SEC completes a review process, uh, shares to be offered, price range for the off offering not yet determined, which is normal. Um, so uh, we'll certainly follow uh, your reporting on this, of course, the very controversial company. I do want to ask you about your other scoop, which is that Microsoft is potentially interested in buying the chat platform Discord. And of course, these two stories are related given the conversation among retail traders that's been happening on platforms like Discord. What do we know about Microsoft's interest in Discord and other companies that might be interested in making a play for Discord as well? Sure. So Discord, you know, is a communications platform that's 
popular with teens and a lot of young people, and um, it's done, you know, really well in the pandemic. So there has been buyer interest, and my understanding is that there's been buyer interest for, for several years now. And Microsoft is one of those um, companies that is, um, you know, has talked to them, and um, we've been told that it would be at least ten billion, most likely, if if they were to sell to Microsoft. Uh, these conversations are preliminary; they're not about to get acquired tomorrow, as reported. But um, we reported that the deal is not imminent. But um, you know, they've talked with Microsoft. They've also talked with Amazon. They have talked with Epic Games on and off over the years. Uh, Discord believes that it can go public, and they had been kind of heading down that path. And so um, one of our sources still feels that an IPO is possible. But, you know, uh, Microsoft is almost a $2 trillion company, so if they're interested in buying Discord, obviously uh, they could pay a price that the Discord can't turn down. So we'll, we'll have to see what happens there. But, um, you know, it's definitely interesting to, to follow these talks. Uh, interesting. All right, uh, Katie Roof, uh, lots of great breaking news from you over the last 24 hours. Again, now Robinhood has confirmed they have filed confidentially for an IPO. The price of the shares, the number of the shares that will be sold not yet determined, but the SEC will be conducting a review and the go public process will move forward. After that, we'll continue to cover uh, the story as that unfolds. Meantime, more executive moves coming out of Amazon, the tech giant bringing veteran Adam Salipsky back to run its cloud computing division, poaching a top leader from Salesforce. He'll be replacing Andy Jassy, who will take over as CEO from Jeff Bezos later this year. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg Tech's Matt Day. So, Matt, uh, what do you make of this move? Uh, is, is Adam Salipsky an, an expected pick or a dark horse? He is a little bit of a dark horse. Now, I'd say the leading candidate was uh, a guy named Matt Garman, who ran AWS's sales and marketing team. Um, Adam, though, is is no stranger to AWS. You know, he was with the business for 11 years. For a lot of the early days, he was um, outgoing CEO Andy Jassy's right hand, you know, leading sales, leading operations, really a, a COO role. So he knows the business well. And you know, for folks who follow them, this isn't going to be much of a surprise at all. So why do you think Amazon is going with Solipsky, you know, I, I would have thought they, they would have chosen an insider. No, you could probably make the argument that he is the equivalent of an insider. I mean, he hasn't been around for, for five years. It's been a pretty big five years for AWS. But, you know, he, he knows the business. He spent more than a decade selling the idea of cloud computing to skeptical companies. And, you know, now he faces, obviously, a much uh, bigger challenge coming to, uh, to a very competitive landscape. You know, Microsoft and Google are... are snapping at Amazon's heels. Um, but he, he knows this company real well. He was said to be real close with Andy Jassy uh, personally. So there, there are a lot of reasons that uh, they might want to bring Adam Slipsky back into the fold here. Are you hearing any reaction yet from your sources internally? A little bit surprised that it wasn't uh, one of the front runners and, and they reached outside. And, and frankly, some just unfamiliarity with him, right? Um, you know, five years isn't so long, but in Amazon Web Services uh, terms, that's a, that's a little while. They've hired thousands and thousands of people since then. The company is, is much larger. Um, so a lot of folks just haven't had firsthand uh, exposure to him before, despite his, his pedigree. All right. Bloomberg's Matt Day, who covers Amazon for us out of Seattle. We'll continue to watch your reporting on this. Thanks so much, Matt, for your analysis there. Coming up, not the homecoming hit it out of the park debut that Baidu was hoping for in its Hong Kong debut. We're going to have more on the motivation behind its secondary listing with Baidu co-founder and CEO Robin Lee. This is Bloomberg. The much-anticipated Hong Kong secondary listing of Baidu fell flat when it opened on the exchange Tuesday. The company raising $3.1 billion ahead of its debut. Ahead of the listing, our own Tom McKenzie sat down with Baidu co-founder and CEO Robin Lee in an exclusive interview where he talked about the rationale for this secondary debut. I think it's quite straightforward. Baidu is based in Beijing, and uh, we want investors in Asia those who are in the same time zone can 
easily invest in, in Baidu. They, they can have a better uh, opportunity to grow with us. And uh, you know, there were uh, US-China tensions for the, the past few years. Uh, I think investors also have this kind of concerns. Although we're not that uh, you know, concerned about uh, delisting, but uh, I, I think uh, having a, another um, uh, exchange um, for, for Baidu stock is it's overall good for, for the investors and also good for uh, people around the, uh, the, the China area to really share our growth. Mm. And of course, you're not the only ones. We've had, of course, Alibaba and NetEase and many yeah, others. Yeah, quite a few companies have done this, yeah. Yeah, it seems like then a bit of a, because of those tensions, a bit of a hedging strategy for mm -hmm. businesses. W was that part of the calculation? Well, it was, but I would say more importantly, it's how we uh, get more exposure to the Asia-based investors. How do we let the, the Chinese investors to really share um, the, the, the Baidu growth story? So we, we always wanted to uh, list it domestically. Uh, Hong Kong is obviously a, a choice. You know, Shenzhen and Shanghai are also options. Uh, after evaluating all kinds of uh, you know, uh, possibilities and uh, uh, the, the criteria for, for listing, uh, it, it turns out that Hong Kong is probably uh, the, the best for us at this time. Are you happy with the ADRs? Are you discussing, have there been discussions about delisting from the US? Uh, we always thought that was a very small possibility, uh, but we, we fully understand some of the investors were kind of concerned about that. Okay, you've raised more than three billion U.S. dollars. What is the priority for putting that money to work then? Uh, you know, Baidu is pretty much based uh, in China. We earned uh, our revenue mostly in, in RMB, not in U.S. dollars. But when we do investment uh, or do acquisitions, a lot of times we, we need to use U.S. dollars. And raising money in, in U.S. dollars could help us to expand our business uh, quickly, either uh, through acquisition or, or in, in investment. And in, in a lot of cases, we, we need that kind of flexibility. What are the growth prospects for the broader business looking like heading into the, the rest of the year? Uh, you know, this year it, we have an easy comp. Last year, because of COVID, mm -hmm. uh, our business was affected. So this year, the, the core business will have a pretty good uh, growth rate. But more importantly, the new business, the, the new AI enabled business, be it uh, uh, AI cloud or intelligent driving, uh, it's been growing very fast, but it, it has reached to a point that the, the scale is not that small. And investors start to feel, oh, it represents 14% of, of your total revenue. And as the you know, uh, base, the, the, the current revenue base become larger, the growth rate uh, becomes higher. That, I, I think people were impressed by that. Although it was uh, you know, not a surprise to me, it, it's always being designed like that. I believe advertising revenue accounts for about 70% of overall revenues. Non-advertising revenue is clearly increasing as we just touched on. Yeah. At what point do you see non-advertising revenue overtaking advertising revenue? And if so, what time frame? Yeah, it will happen. I, I cannot see uh, you know, accurately which year, but uh, I think the trend is quite clear. Mm. Uh, this is not, uh, you know, Baidu is not alone. If you look at other uh, you know, large internet companies, uh, most of them, uh, for, for most of them, advertising is a, you know, uh, is a minority of their revenue. For us, it, it's, it's, it's like a, a monopoly, which is just started with an uh, you know, online marketing business. But, uh, as a large platform, you know, people, you know, hundreds of millions of people come to Baidu every day, right? Besides showing them ads, there are lots of things we can do with them. We can help them. We, we, we can charge membership fee. We can do live streaming. We can uh, offer online games. We can have transactions, e-commerce. There are lots of ways to, to really monetize the, 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 the traffic. We, we, we just got started on that. Baidu co-founder Robin Lee there will be watching how those new shares perform in Hong Kong. Meantime, coming up, big moves upward for Intel shares and after hours trading, as the company says, it'll spend $20 billion on two new chip plants in Arizona in a big new strategy. We'll have more reaction from the street next. This is Bloomberg.
Circling back to news out of Intel, this hour, new CEO Pat Gelsinger unveiling plans for a manufacturing revival, putting them into even stiffer competition with arguably the world's best chip maker, Taiwan Semi. For more, I want to bring in Cody Acri, managing director and equity analyst for Loop Capital Markets, who's got a sell rating and a $50 price target on Intel. We're just getting headlines, uh, more headlines, Cody, from the call that you've been listening in on. Intel saying they'll pursue customers like Apple, like Qualcomm as part of their foundry business. Uh, you've had a sell rating on Intel. Does this change your call? Well, it's it's definitely more optimistic. Uh, I am encouraged that they're making the change. Um, I wish that uh, semiconductor changes of this magnitude could be done quickly, but they just unfortunately will not be able to. So we're still talking about 2023 as the really the earliest time that we're going to see seven nanometer production of any volume, and it's and it, that's just ramping. So it will be 24 and 25 when we see really the breadth of that. So we're just not going to see a lot of improvements in their lithography trajectory, which means that companies like TSMC and, and others will, will still lead in that area. Uh, going forward, TSMC will become a competitor, uh, but Intel will also become a customer. Um, so I think uh, TSMC will gladly take on the competition for the, uh, the customer base that Intel has. More headlines coming from the call. Uh, Intel saying that their new strategy doesn't depend on government aid. As you say, it'll take a long time. And uh, given the time that it will take, do you still recommend folks sell or are you going to be reevaluating? Well, we're always reevaluating. And, and we know that Intel obviously has the capital, the resources, the experience, all the assets to, to do well and to uh, to succeed. So we never want to count that out. They just unfortunately have, have let themselves into a bit of a, a lagging trend, uh, maybe more capitalizing on their prior assets, getting good cash flow. But that really did allow others like TSMC um, and AMD as a TSMC customer to get ahead in manufacturing process, and that's now causing Intel to lose share. Uh, that share loss will continue no matter what they talk about today. And so that is uh, that we are at a sell rating. We like what we're seeing. I just wish it would happen faster. So, look, Intel has missed many Super high profile production deadlines, 10 nanometers, 7 nanometer. But they're saying that these new factories will be pushing the beyond the, the boundaries even beyond 7 nanometers. Can Pat Gelsinger pull this off? Is he going to become the rock star of the chip world? What chances do you give him? Well, I, I don't know if I, how I add a chance to that, but, uh, but I think he, he's very well respected within the industry, more than capable. Um, I think if he is really dedicated to the things that he's touting today, uh, that this will put Intel on a much more competitive footing, uh, would be much uh, more uh, amenable to a buy rating if that were the case. But again, um, I think you're going to get this honeymoon period that Mr. Gelsinger is, is in today where people are looking for the changes, looking for optimism, anything to, to hang on to with Intel. And that's the right thing to do, but that's pretty short-lived because they also just gave their fiscal guidance for the full year, and that is shy of consensus by about $600 million for the full year, and EPS is about $0.23 cents below the consensus. So so that's, that's at least headlining a relatively difficult year for the rest of the remainder. So the question is, when the honeymoon is over, will it be a match made in heaven? I'm going to be speaking with Pat tomorrow on Bloomberg Television. What are the tough questions we should be asking him? Well, I think it is just a matter of is there are there further things, because this is a, a major shift, but are there further things that they can do to continue to accelerate the transformation? Um, uh, more investments in R&D, they, they talked about, and partnering with uh, IBM is obviously a good move. But again, an investment in R&D doesn't typically translate to revenue in the door until uh, for many years, uh, maybe sometimes in five to ten years. So we need to see trajectory from Intel. The investors will uh, will like this, but we're probably right now getting what the investors had looked for, why they were excited and pushing the stock higher was that Gelsinger was going to come in and give this kind of an announcement. He's now done that. 
and he's telling us that we're, we've got a good Q1, so now if that's in the stock, uh, but he's also telling us it's a difficult 21. Um, so what do you get from here on out? As a catalyst, it's primarily just earnings, and those earnings are going to be challenging for Intel Wildwood losing share. And continuing to listen into this call, more headlines. Intel saying they believe they'll get a positive response from governments. We can presume that the Biden administration will be pretty happy with two new factories on U.S. soil. Uh, the company also saying they don't require a penny of government money for their new foundry business. But, of course, uh, huge challenges ahead in terms of whether the company can pull this off. Cody Acri of Loop Capital, thanks so much for joining us. I'll let you get back to the call now. I've been taking notes for our conversation with Pat Gelsinger tomorrow. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Do not miss our big interview with Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger. You can catch that conversation starting at 1 p.m. Eastern time on Bloomberg Television throughout the day and back here on Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.